Hello, the world. This is Save Will Kill, a true crime podcast. I'm Sadie Eck. And I am Courtney Eck. And it was going to be my night, but then Courtney texted and was like, hey, I got a really crazy story. Can I do it tonight? And I was like, heck yeah, you can, which yeah. is a good thing because I am a little brain dead. You guys, yeah, sometimes you, I don't know if I've ever had this experience to this level where you dig into a story and it gets crazier and crazier and crazier and crazier and crazier. So this is the crazy, crazy, diabolical, wild case of Oki Al Kite. <laughs> Oh, that's quite a name. I know, isn't it a wonderful little name? Mm -hmm. So, in March of 2004, a man calling himself Robert Cooper took out money from a 7-Eleven in the University of Colorado Hospital in Aurora, Colorado, which 100% is cursed, I'm convinced. Yes, we talked so about that. So many cases there. So many cases. And he used it to buy a burner phone nearby. It's beautiful, and we were born nearby, and I love everything about Colorado, so I'm definitely not trying to smack talk Aurora, but man, some something weird in that soil. Mm -hmm. Cooper was looking for a new place to live and so needed the phone to call local landlords who were advertising rental homes. Cooper told the individuals that he contacted that he was an employee of Wells Fargo, had recently moved to the area from the East Coast, and was living with his sister while he looked for a place of his own. Cooper toured several homes and eventually came to the property of a man named Oki Alkite, who went by Al, who had a basement apartment in his home that he rented for extra income. Al Kite was born in 1951 in Nash County, North Carolina, and had a very normal upbringing, and his mother passed away when he was 18 years old. In 2004, Al was a single man who lived alone in his townhouse and remained close to a stepdaughter from a previous marriage, but had no other children. He worked at a consultancy firm in Denver, and before that he had worked for an engineering firm, which had allowed him to live on both coasts and even in, I and even in Algeria for five years, so he was extremely well-traveled and very intelligent. Can you tell me the year again? 2004. Okay. When the job opportunity arose in Colorado in 1998, he jumped on it as he was an avid outdoorsman and loved a variety of outdoor activities which Colorado was known for. He had plenty of friends, was in a serious relationship with a woman named Linda, and was described as a, quote, kind, trusting, and generous individual who lived a very low-risk life. So in May of 2004, Al's longtime tenant moved out, and so he posted an ad in the University of Colorado Medical School's library and in a local newspaper to get the word out about the space for rent, and that's how he met Cooper. Cooper set up two initial visits to Al's home, and one would assume the first was to tour the property, and the second was a follow-up to discuss the details of their agreement and for Cooper to drop off his deposit money. Al's girlfriend Linda said she only got a quick look at Cooper as he left after his first visit, and while she didn't get a clear look at his face, she said that he was dressed very nicely in nice pants and a suit jacket. Al informed her a couple of days later that he'd agreed to rent him the apartment. So on May 22, 2004, Linda was flying to visit her brother in Virginia Beach, and so Al drove her to the airport. On the way, he let her know that he planned to make a couple of repairs to the apartment and to help Cooper move in a couple of heavier items. Linda called when she landed at 3.30 p.m. and said that he was unusually quiet during the call. She said she assumed Cooper was in the room with him and so Al was being a little reserved in the conversation because he was in front of someone he didn't know that well and was feeling a little self-conscious. I also read that she said that he was in a perfectly good mood and told her he'd just fixed a pipe with the neighbor, <laughs> mm -hmm. but regardless, he was alive at 3.30 p.m. and was able to answer the phone. So the next day was a Sunday, and Al didn't show up to play golf with a friend, and then didn't show up for work on Monday, which aroused suspicions. His workmates eventually called his sister in Virginia, who was listed as his emergency contact, and she called the local police and requested a wellness check as it was deeply out of character for Al to miss work with no notice. Police entered Al's home and found an extremely gruesome scene in the basement apartment. Trigger warning, you guys, for extreme violence and torture. I won't go into too many details, but it is pretty bad. 
So they found Al in the bedroom and his body had been hogtied with, quote, cords and very specific ligatures and knots. And the bindings had then been removed from the scene by the killer. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so there was, it was obvious that he had been hog, hogtied, but they mm-hmm. were, the bindings Taken were not away. there. Mm-hmm. They determined that he had been tortured over a number of hours, including an ice pick being inserted into parts of his face, oh. blunt force trauma, foot whipping, and stabbing. No, 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 no. Yep. While it seemed that the torture occurred throughout the entire day, authorities were pretty sure Al had passed away on the 22nd, the same day that Linda had left on her trip. Wow, that's awful. Yep. When police searched the upstairs of the home, there were no signs of a struggle, but there were signs that Cooper had spent a lot of time in Al's home after the murder. He'd used Al's shower, slept in his bed, cooked and ate food in his kitchen, and had worn some of his clothing. Wow. Cooper had also, quote, put several knives, other small weapons, the house keys Kite had given him, and some other items in the kitchen sink and filled it with bleach. So basically Mm -hmm. anything he'd touched. Mm Mm-hmm. All of the surfaces in the home had been wiped clean, and bleach had been poured down the drains to destroy any potential evidence. It seems that Cooper then took Al's wallet, phone, and truck keys, stole Al's truck, and drove to an ATM where he withdrew $1,000 while wearing gloves and a ski mask to cover his identity. Wow, really thought this shit through. Uh, Just wait, Sadie. Just you wait. He then used several of Al's credit cards to make purchases around town, which I don't, I don't, they're undisclosed for some reason, but then drove the truck to a couple of blocks from Al's home and abandoned it. He then walked back to Al's house where he put the truck keys in the bleach solution in the sink and disappeared. Wow. Authorities learned that Cooper had met with several potential landlords before settling on Al, so we're like, sweet, we'll get a slam dunk description since he interacted with so many people in the area. Wrong. Capital W, wrong. What? Quote, Cooper's story and appearance were rather fluid and everybody seemed to have met somebody different. Oh my God. Witnesses, yes, witnesses described him as ranging from late twenties to mid fifties. What? At 50s? times, he, yes. At times, he affected an accent, while others detected none. Wow. When Cooper met Al, he was using a cane to support himself and had a severe limp. But other people said that that was absent when they met him. It's like a what's that? Thing? Kaiser Sose. <laughs> it's not who I was thinking of, but we'll go with it. Yes. Who are you thinking of? The catch me if you can, guy. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Just a master of disguise. Yeah. But murder disguise. But it's like tortured murder. What premeditated the murder from uh, hell disguise. Uh, yes. Lee. Al told Linda that Cooper had been in his mid forties with wavy brown hair, stood around five eight, and weighed around one hundred eighty pounds. So I'm assuming he was like. Fully average build, maybe slightly short. One witness said Cooper gave her a really bad feeling, and others said he seemed perfectly normal. The woman who got the bad feeling said she didn't say said he didn't say much during their meeting to see her home, but that he was strangely preoccupied with studying the windows around the home. Oh no, dude! Yeah, mm-hmm. she was like, "Hair stand up, get the fuck out of my house." Yeah, uh, no. Could you imagine being one of these other people that he had interviewed for their rentals? Oh, no. No. To make the investigation even more frustrating, Cooper waited 30 days before he activated the burner phone, knowing that 7-Elevens, where he purchased the phone, delete all of their surveillance camera footage after storing it for 30 days. Wow. I'm going to just say wow 150 times this just, episode. Just, there's so much more wow to come to. And wow, lowercase wow in a bad way or capital wow, I don't, this case is fucking crazy. Yeah. He never made a single personal call on the phone, only using it to reach out to potential landlords. And he moved all over Aurora to make the calls. So there wasn't a single point to help determine his home base or places he frequented, which was also kind of advanced intelligence in 2004, because I don't think we were fully aware of how cell phones worked then. Right. I mean, you know what the I'm information saying? was available. We just didn't yeah. know about it. It wasn't common knowledge for yeah. true crime wasn't rampant in popular culture yet. 
So he also used stolen addresses and social security numbers when filling out the applications for the homes he was inquiring about. And it'll come as no surprise that the name Coop, that the name Robert Cooper was a fake name. Mm-hmm. Once he'd killed Al, he placed his phone, his phone and Al's phone in an area frequented by homeless people, knowing the phones would be picked up and paying all over the city to throw them off and stall them even more. <sighs> Courtney, I just I cannot get over it. But what if he had actually accidentally used his real name? That would have been pretty embarrassing. <laughs> just as, like the most perfect, meticulous, well thought out, well covered up crime ever. But Whoopsie. one tiny detail. I mean, we've covered so many crimes that are exactly like that. Like you've thought of everything except for mm-hmm. the most important detail. Right. So the only health. So the only helpful piece of evidence that was found and it is a potentially extremely helpful piece, was a single drop of blood in Al's apartment. Good old Parabon Nanolabs used the Mm -hmm. blood, which we talked about in a recent episode, to create a snapshot of physical characteristics of Al's killer when he would have been 25, but they don't know how old he was when he committed the murder or how old he is now. I guess I'd never thought of that, especially if you don't know how, like, there's such a wide age range. Yeah. Well, the ones, they also created one for when he was 44. They found one. So there's one for when he could have, would be 25 and would be 44. Wouldn't it be crazy if you could age somebody with their DNA? Like, there'd be a way to say how old they were at the time of the sample? Yes, yes, yes. And I've kind of thought that there was. But <laughs> yeah. Not, I mean, there is not. I mean, there might be now, but there was not right. around this time. So he is a Southeast European male of unknown age and unknown body type who likely has fair or very fair complexion, brown or hazel eyes, black to brown hair, and few or no freckles. Oh, well, that narrows it down. I know, right? (laughs) One of the people who interviewed Cooper for a room said he spoke with a Romanian accent, and that person happened to be a professor who was very familiar with Eastern European languages, so it could be a clue if their recollection is accurate. Hmm. Police pretty quickly ruled out robbery as a motivation for the killing, as Cooper did take out some money and used Al's credit cards, but Al had a significant amount more in his bank account, and there were no additional withdrawals, and nothing of value was taken from the home. Good old Paul Holes took a deeper look at this case, and specifically wondered if the way Al was bound was a clue toward the killer's true identity because mm-hmm. the bindings were really elaborate and very specific. They specifically... Sailor. Pardon? Well, Sa- well, sailor. He, he actually <laughs> consulted with like a binding expert, and that's what he said. He was like, well, probably a sailor. It's always a sailor. <laughs> yeah. And so the knots, you know, normally when you're hogtied, it's just between your wrists and your ankles, and his... Uh, bindings went up over his elbow and then also up over uh, his knee. Oh, I did so, not like that. No, and he also knew to use like a, a rod to oh, pull no. as hard as he could rather than it's using like his hands. Military. So he, exactly, yes. Ugh, I don't know why I know so much about knots and hot <laughs> He's oh, like, I don't like this about Sailor, myself. 100% military. Yeah. So Paul Holes consulted with an expert who pointed out that one of the ways Al was tortured was by several whips and cuts to the bottom of his feet. It's just the... uh, No. The the details are so horrifying, but that one in particular, no, thank you. Well, and it's more horrifying to know, it's a common practice of torture in Turkey for extracting information from people. Mm -hmm. The origin of hog tying is also from a Turkish group called Hezbollah, which mm-hmm. is a, quote, Kurdish Sunni Islamist military militant organization. And that, group, and that group is also known for their torture tactics, specifically with sharp objects. Like I mentioned before, one witness said Cooper had spoken to her with a Romanian accent. And one expert said that a lot of Romanians migrate into Turkey, either for industrial jobs or to go to university. And the Turkish Hezbollah... And the Turkish Hezbollah specifically recruited those populations of people, those immigrant people. Mm -hmm. The Hezbollah got too powerful over time, and in 2000, the government cracked down on the group, resulting in several of them being arrested and many others fleeing, and where nobody knows where they ended up. So, Paul Holes' theory is that Cooper participated in this specific form of torture against other Turkish rebels, 
enjoyed doing it. Mm -hmm. And so when he arrived in the United States, he decided to re-engage in the practice either for pleasure or for pay. Oh, boy. Yes. Either way, that's so awful. Chilling to the maximum. Yes. So I also found an article written by Michael Whelan of Unresolved Podcast, who pointed out that there was another very similar murder that occurred in 1999, and the victim, a 54-year-old man named Lee Scott Hall, worked at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, which is the same company that Al worked at around that time. Mm -hmm. So Lee Hall had been working as a lead designer on a $1.2 billion national ignition facility, which, quote, when completed, will monitor the nation's nuclear stockpile without the need for underground testing, which (laughs) I know exactly what that means. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, clear sense. (laughs) Um, So Hall determined that a mistake had been made. This all sounds so fake, but it's real. Hall determined that a mistake had been made when there was a miscalculation in the installation process of the super laser beams. <laughs> honest to God, okay. this is real. Okay. Yep. That would cost the company a minimum of a million, and in one place, I read multi-millions of dollars to fix. Uh-oh. The project was already five years behind schedule and $350 million over budget. The fix was eventually approved, and around the same time, Hall received a very large pay increase. One month later, though, on October 20th, 1999, Hall didn't show up for work, and some co-workers went into his home to check on him. Hall's body was found face down in his bedroom, and he had been severely beaten and stabbed to death over a long period of time. There was no sign of a robbery or a struggle of any kind in the rest of the home, indicating that the killer must have known him, but Hall was notoriously reclusive and orderly, so no one knew who that person might have been. Similar, very similar to Al's murder, Hall's vehicle was found a block away from his home with his wallet inside with all of his contents intact. His car keys were never found. Hmm. So detectives who worked the case said that the Lawrence Liver So detectives who worked the case said that Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory was not at all cooperative in the investigation and one of them commented quote we are not getting the whole picture from that lab. Hmm. The lab responded by saying quote the Livermore police have given us no formal connection between Mr. Hall's death and the lab they just haven't done that said spokeswoman Susan Houghton. We have cooperated with them at every level, and we would continue to cooperate. Mr. Hall was very well liked, and his death was a terrible loss to the project. We want to see it resolved, but a direct connection to his work at NIF, the connection is just not there. So they thought that he maybe was killed because of the work he was doing? Because of the well, delays? He- he's the one that figured out that there was an issue. And so oh, okay. they're already under tremendous pressure they're behind schedule, they are massively over budget, and he was like, oops a daisy, you guys, there was a miscalculation, and these lasers are not going to fit or work or turn the way they need to turn for this to be successful, right. and it was going to cost, I saw a million dollars in some place else, I saw multi-millions of dollars okay. to fix it. They did fix it, they did approve the fix, and around the same time, he got a pay raise, so the suspicion is that either... There was something in relation to his work and like him being a whistleblower or something, you know, Mm -hmm. or somebody else. He got somebody else in trouble, maybe, Mm -hmm. because he, you know, because he found the miscalculation. So maybe that person got in trouble and then he got Mm -hmm. a pay raise and then that person was like, oh, hell no, (laughs) you know. Right, right. But it was just really suspicious. And then after he died, the lab was like deeply unhelpful. Right. Granted, this is like high, high security government contract sh- just sort of shit with super totally. lasers involved right. and stuff. Stranger so, things shit, sounds like. Basically, so they're not going to be like, oh, come on in, darlings. Yes, please help yourself to all of our <laughs> high clearance Secrets. information. Right. Yes, right. But one of the detectives on the case said that the lab didn't reveal that Hall had discovered the expensive error so close to his murder until about four months after his death. And it is a significant detail. Mm -hmm. Quote, is it connected to his death? The detective asked. I can't tell you for sure. 
maybe there are some things others above his co-workers don't want to be made public. Uh-oh. Hall was an extremely private, hard-working, studious individual who didn't seem to interact with enough people in his life to create any enemies, but he clearly created one, and no one knows who that person is to this day. Ugh, Courtney. So, I decided, Courtney Eck was like, let's just Google, Google, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory and the word murder to see if there are any other murders associated with the place. And guess what, guys? There oh, are. No. Oh, no. Yes. Courtney, they're going to yes. come for us. And Laura was like, why are you telling me this? <laughs> it's like, sleep with one eye open. Oh, yes. I'm way more afraid of strange laboratories than I am, like, dudes. Not really, well, but kind of. <laughs> I am not alleging anything. I am just going to state the facts, mm-hmm. and the facts are fucking weird, y'all. Uh, I don't like it. Okay, and you've probably heard of this case. I kind of pissed my pants a little bit when I saw that this case is associated with this fucking laboratory. So on October 14th, 1995, so this is 95, Hall was 99, and then Al was 2004. So these are within 10 years of each other. So on October 14, 1995, aerobics instructor Kathy Mauser left to teach a class and reminded her 14-year-old daughter Gemma that she was grounded on the way out because she didn't want her to use the phone while she was gone. When Kathy returned home, Gemma was nowhere to be found. Her body was later found nude and dumped near a walnut orchard, and she had been brutally beaten and strangled to death via ligature. Mm. Gemma had defied her parents and made several calls that day to her friends, and on one of them, her friend said she hung up the phone very suddenly without saying goodbye. Gemma's stepfather, Douglas Mauser, worked at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory and had the highest security clearance as a computer expert for the company. He claimed that he had been at that lab that day, And when I was reading about Hall, one of the employees said, we work seven days a week. That's just what we do. Like, it was a direct quote about Mm -hmm. Hall. Mm -hmm. They work all the time. He's like, Hall was super studious. And he just fell in line. You know, he's a great employee. He fell in line. So, Mauser, Douglas Mauser said, I was at work. I was at the laboratory. And so, when police looked for the security footage from that day, the cameras hadn't been working. Of course not. They also weren't working at the the jack-in-the-box where he claimed he'd stop for lunch. (laughs) You are kidding me. No, Sadie. Stranger Things. Cover up. Stranger Things. Courtney. uh, Sadie, just wait. Just wait. Looking out my window. Just wait. Police then searched Douglas's car and, quote, brought in Gary Robertson, a Canadian specialist in photogrammetry. The practice of using the practice of using mathematical calculations to uncover information about a picture. Okay, you're just making shit up at this point. <laughs> How <laughs> legitimate does that sound? How often have you heard of photogrammetry used? Yeah. So, quote, Robertson theorized that postmortem indentations found on Gemma's thigh matched the impressions a seatbelt and car rug in Douglas Mauser's vehicle would leave if her body lay in a certain position. Okay. There was also some evidence that they found star thistle in Douglas's car that could also be that could also be found in the area that Gemma's body was found. The prosecution decided to charge him with the murder of his stepdaughter based on this evidence. No, they didn't. Yes, Sadie. Yes, because a Canadian guy said, look at this picture of her body, of her thigh. Mm-hmm whoop match up to no, his seatbelt no, no. and rug in his car no uh, i've no i mean we've heard I and mean, we've talked about so much pseudo forensics yeah that's like at the top of the list i've never heard of anything more outlandish yeah. like the craziest far-fetched. the craziest thing too is that there is a forensic files about this case I was and it sounds like it yes <laughs> And everybody, if you go to Reddit or any post, Google post, um, chat rooms to read about this, everyone's like, this is the garbagest, garbagey evidence forensics that we've ever heard of. Like, this is crazy. Crazy. So their theory was... Sorry, just like 
there, what else could make those indentations? And what el- where else could you get that thistle seed or whatever? Like, you know? Yeah, yeah. we live we live in the country. It's, thistles are fucking everywhere. everywhere. You cannot get rid of them. <laughs> no. no. My no. dog brings them in on his thing. My dog is like planting murder evidence all over town with yes. his little harness. Yes. yes. It's cr- yeah. That's they were like, "Yep, case closed. No. Bring him in." Yes. So their theory was that Douglas was sick of his daughter's teen attitude. She was also diagnosed with um oppositional defiance disorder. So I think she was like a really naughty teen, but mm-hmm. He was sick of her attitude, and when he came home and found her on the phone, which she was not supposed to be using, he snapped and beat her to death and then strangled her with a ligature. Not likely. Not Not likely at all. He then removed her clothes and dumped her body to make it look like a serial killing, and it worked. Douglas Mauser was convicted of second-degree murder and remains in prison for her (laughs) murder to this day. On that evidence alone. Yes, Sadie. Yes. Wow. Yes. Because wow. they couldn't find him because they couldn't find him on the security cameras and this photo and this thistle. Crazy things. Crazy. Well, how are they suggesting that he somehow got the f- footage? No, like, they're just saying the you were lying. Wasn't there, right? We have no evidence that you were there. Yeah, they're like, but you can't prove that you were at work or but at the, at the Jack in the Box. How would he know? That there was no footage. Like, it wouldn't be no, an I'm alibi. T- no, no, I know. I'm just saying, like, just because you can't say he was there doesn't mean he wasn't there. Yeah, but they were like, right. you don't have an alibi. So it was you, period. Wow. Like, you were mad at her. She was a bratty teen. Case closed. I don't like that. So I couldn't find one quote from Douglas or any indication that the lab had anything to do with it, but it is very strange to me that three extremely gruesome and unexplainable murders took place within 10 years and all of the victims worked at or were close to high-ranking employees of the lab. Mm -hmm. I did also find... (laughs) I did also find a 2015 article, get this, about how an 80-year-old woman apparently mistook her gas pedal for her brake pedal drove up over the curb and 60 feet into a gym and she ran straight into 49 year old Catherine Barker who is the CFO of Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory at the time what yes Sadie she was taking a resistance training class at 6 30 in the morning when she was struck and killed oh my god five others were injured but no one else died um uh, <laughs> <laughs> right uh, um it's stranger it's things are spooky happening. it's spooky that is weird mm-hmm. that is really weird to me right am i how wrong is the how big is the laboratory huge so, like, so it's, we need to date we need to take a bunch of other labs we need to do some some statistics here like get the other labs doing high security yeah. shit and then right. look at how many people are murdered and is this lab normal like is this the right. normal amount of burners that happen at regardless like i don't think i mean if there are a bunch of people getting murders at any laboratory even if that is like a thing that comes with being you know like high security that's still a problem <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? yes. yes like are you yes, working so. working in you know Walmart's corporate headquarters are not getting gro- groom like brutally murdered, gruesomely, gruesomely brutally yes. murdered, or have it being framed for their stepdaughter's gruesome right. brutal murders. Right? Yeah, I agree with you. Yes, it seems very strange. And that last one really set me over the edge too. Yeah, that's it was like some that Jason is born. Like she got turned right. on. <laughs> yes, it took a while. I mean, she lived most of her life, but then, yeah, you know, God. And, and she was the CFO. She was in the C suite right. of the laboratory, and six thirty in the morning. Like, what is an eighty-year-old woman doing out there? And what a perfect assassin! If you're going to yes. assassinate somebody, like pretending like an eighty-year-old woman doesn't. Was, did she survive the crash? Yeah. Yep, everybody survived except for the woman that she hit. That's that's crazy. Yeah. And it's also like, we have a friend who mistook the gas, but I think it's a common thing to do. I think people do it pretty frequently, but 
I don't think you go <clears throat> up over in and 60 feet. That is the thing that really kind of got me to, yeah. you know, maybe once you get the gas going and trajectory or whatever, but <laughs> I don't like know, it. man, that really freaked me out. Yeah. It's just weird. It's just all a little too weird. So back to poor Al Kite, who started this whole thing. Police are pretty sure that whoever Robert Cooper is, he meticulously planned the murder for a very long time and simply wanted to experience torturing and killing an innocent man. Al's sister Barbara said, quote, It's so hard to imagine why it was done. The guy was doing it for the thrill. He just wanted to find people to kill. He brought his own little torturing kit. He knew he had all the time in the world. She thinks Al was targeted because Cooper knew he'd be alone and because of his kind and helpful nature. I hate it. I don't entirely know, but that shit, no matter how you slice it, is deeply, deeply disturbing. And WT heck, you guys, what is happening? That's so crazy. Yeah. Like if we if we don't have to worry about the Stranger Things lab coming for us, we got to worry about this other psychopath. Yeah, that's what I mean. It's like horrible. Even if the even if somebody paid Cooper to do what he did and he's like known, you know, he's like and that's what kind of once I started reading or listening to the Paul Hole stuff, I was like, well shit. If this guy was a trained torturer, you know, by a militant group, and then comes to the United States, gets like intercepted, you know, by whomever. And they're like, well, now that you're here, we might as well use you or so, you know, it's like, ugh. or he's just a, or he's just a horrible killer. He's just a psychopath. It seems like, you know, his MO is so clearly like what other murders have been this well planned? Right. And has he stopped now? Because if it was just for the thrill of it, he is not going to stop. Correct. Just after Correct. one. It's not like, oh, that itch was scratched. Yeah. And there were two other murders that I read about that were very similar. Like the men were bound. It was middle-aged men. They were bound. They were, you know, like t- took their time. They were sort of tortured and stabbed and beaten to death. You know, it was a similar MO. But they were in like Kentucky and then someplace else. And... Of course, Israel Keys came up, but then people were like, well, is mm-hmm. Israel Keys it doesn't fit that genetic description, but everybody, you know, it's like any any murder that's unsolved definitely happened because Israel Keys did it, but, right, you know, of course. similar. Yeah. Um, How old was Al? He was in his, I want to say late, let me pull it back up. He was... Mm-mm. He was born in 51. Okay. So, like our dad's age. But, yep. in, but in 2004. Yes, correct. So, 50s. Yeah. So he wasn't old. No, no, no. He was a, you know, he was a active, like, doing life. Yeah. No, yep. he could have defended himself. His, his girlfriend said he was a pacifist, so she wasn't surprised that Cooper got the best of him. Yeah. Yeah. He said, like, once he realized, and there was only one way in and out of the basement, so she said once he realized that he was trapped, he would have just, like, complied because that was his sort of personality. That's so awful. Beyond awful. Yeah. Yep. And then there was a part of me, too, that was like, what if it's not just one person? You know, because it, I don't know, it just has such a vibe of, like, super mystery and super like ugh, you know it mm-hmm. and maybe i'm manufacturing that because i went down that rabbit hole with the lab and paul holes mm-hmm. and all this stuff but you know people are like he's all these different people but i was like what if he was several different people like what if they were working together you know <laughs> to do this like it just like a torture mm-hmm. club or something right i mean I you know don't, no i don't yes that's so scary to think about yep and there's no the evidence of that whatsoever, other than the fact right. that people were like, but I, I mean, I think it was probably one person just sort of mixing up his identity as he went along to throw them off. But it, I mean, you never know. It could be yeah. two, three people doing it together. Ugh. Well, thanks for that. My nightmare fuel. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, we're the, cool. now the targets of fucking 
super lab laser town laboratory usa <laughs> god it's gonna be like and in breaking news the sisters of they will kill <laughs> It's going to have to be something super, super, like, off the wall. Like, we mm-hmm. both simultaneously got struck by hang gliders or something. Yes, right? Oh, right? I don't like it, yes. I don't like it. So, what do you guys think? Are we on to something? Are we reaching? Let's, are let's there, hope we're reaching. <laughs> are there <laughs> Turkish assassins in the United States yeah. working for top-secret labs to disappear people I mean, or is it all just are. a you know crazy crazy weird coincidence that all of these cases had one thing in common Ugh. and it's a crazy high security laboratory tell us what you think it's fucking terrible and i think i mean they will have had to find this guy eventually right they've got his blood they've got his dna and they know they're going so they're smart. like He's going to stay out of CODIS. Yeah. And they are trying to use genealogy now to find him. That is their mm-hmm. next step. But mm-hmm. he's Balkan and he's not from here. And so it will probably take a while for that to work itself through from what I could ascertain. Wow. But Paul, Paul Holes is on the case because he was like, I can't stop thinking about this case. And I definitely <laughs> will not be stopping thinking about this case. Yeah, me either. None, no, none of us will. No. Nope. Don't like it. Sorry, buds, but I love you. Yeah, thanks for watching.